Well, thank you very, very much. It is a real, real honor to be here uh, in beautiful Lisbon and at this amazing event. I very much enjoyed the morning. What I'm going to talk about, I think, follows perfectly on what you just heard from Rose. I'm going to talk about how the representations of science, how the representations of stem cells are having an impact. And I think this is an incredibly important topic. In fact, we did a study uh, of the stem cell research community, and we found that this was the number one concern of the stem cell community. This is the misrepresentation of stem cells in the marketing of unproven therapies. So I, I think looking at twisted science matters, and that's what I'm going to do today. So what is the problem? Well, we've heard a little bit about it from Rose and from others. Uh, there have been many documented cases of the selling of unproven stem cell therapies. In fact, I think it's fair to say this industry is growing. It's growing. It's becoming a massive international industry. We're seeing injuries associated with this. Here's the, the case that Rose talked about. The, the, and there are many others I could point to of people getting injured at these clinics, physical harm. But we're also seeing it spread across pop culture more broadly. Here's Kim Kardashian, and she's getting the vampire facial. Have you guys heard of the vampire facial? Well, if not, there it is. I've, I, we actually filmed a person getting one of these procedures, and they're injecting blood into, into her face for an anti-aging reason. I'm not recommending this, by the way. Uh, but she is doing this, uh, or the, the companies that are doing this, are leveraging the excitement around stem cells to sell something that is unproven. And by the way, uh, Kim's, uh, Kim's uh, facial, not only does it not work, it's a vegan stain. Uh, I don't know how that works out. But she also, uh, it's also a procedure that has been associated with risk. So people have been exposed to HIV and hepatitis, by the way, also, from getting this procedure. So this phenomenon, which I call science exploitation, taking an exciting field of, of research like stem cells, uh, exploiting that language, to market unproven therapy. And it's happening all over the place. You're seeing it happening with genomics, you're seeing it happening with the microbiome, uh, and now you're seeing it, well, we've been seeing it for a long time in, in the space of stem cells. Now, of course, of course, this has been around for a long time, this idea of science exploitation. As soon as there, as soon as there was a scientific discovery uh, and there was pop culture, there were unproven therapies, okay? Uh, when electricity was an exciting big deal, there were a whole bunch of unproven therapies that are associated with electricity, like this electric belt here that would cure almost everything. Uh, and here's Tesla, uh, the, the guy, not the car, uh, in, his, in his laboratory, you know, a very exciting time. So there were a whole bunch of, of therapies that were leveraging that pop culture coverage and that excitement. Uh, like this one, this is one of the very first, uh, I've got a musical interlude happening here. Uh, this is one of the very first uh, forms of Viagra. I don't recommend this either. Um, but it was an electric therapy uh, that was used. Should I answer that call? No? <laughs> Let's go. Um, and then we, have, we had, uh, when magnetism became a big deal, um, we had things like this. This is a magnetic suit. By the way, you can still buy this. And one of the things I love about this uh, as an example of science exploitation is because it looks so much like the stem cell uh, advertisings we're, we're seeing now. So this is a magnetic suit, and you can't read this, but it says it can cure uh, liver problems, kidney problems, heart problems. Uh, it will also cure writer's cramp. Uh, it will cure giddiness. And by the way, every other form of disease. I mean, that is an impressive suit, right? So, but this is the kind of thing we're seeing. Uh, this is my all-time favorite example of science exploitation, though, and I'm sure people, in the, some people in the room, uh, fans of the history of science, will remember this one or know about this one. This is radium water. So we had Madame Curie and all the excitement around around radiation. Um, very exciting time in science, and of course there were therapies that were being sold, unproven therapies associated with radiation. So these were products, as many people probably know, that were actually radioactive. You could, get, you could get pendants uh, and necklaces that were radioactive, that would, would give you energy. <laughs> um, and you could actually have radium water delivered to your house to drink. Uh, and it was actually radioactive. And here's a really good example. This is a, a, from uh, an article from that time. 
uh, Madame Curie's discovery about radium. Uh, we, we, again, get lots of press. Uh, it's based on the premise that radiation taken in, in the right amount of doses will provide a metabolic kick, I bet it did, <laughs> to the, bo the body's endocrine system and infuse depleted organs with energy, right? Uh, this is exactly the kind of language you're seeing now with stem cells. Uh, and by the way, this, this story comes from uh, an article about this guy. He was a famous uh, golfer who died as a result of consuming, um, uh, consuming this radium water. And I love the headline for the article. The radium water worked fine <laughs> until his jaw came off, right? So that's kind of where we are, right? That's kind of where we are. Um, and now we have this going on, right? We have ad after ad after ad for unproven stem cell therapies, right? Um, and this, was, this is one of those uh, stories. It's supposed to look like a real story, but it's really an ad. New stem cell formula save is flying off the shelf. I'm sure it is. Uh, and there's a hotline that you're supposed to call, um, but they're going to shut it down right away so everyone get on their phone right now <laughs> to get this new product. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this problem, the marketing of unproven stem cell therapies. This is a topic that I'm sure everyone's very familiar with, so I'll do this quickly. But if you Google stem cell therapy, and I just did this, by the way, I just did this, you are going to get a half a billion hits, okay? A half a billion hits. And, and what do you get? You get a, a stories like this. This is a clinic in Mexico offering stem cell therapies, again, like the magnet suit, right? Like the magnet suit that offers a cure for just about everything, right? Very, very typical, the kind of thing you'll see. Here's a very well-known one in, in Ukraine called M-Cell. Again, here are their top treatments for autism, anti-aging, heart disease, diabetes, on and on and on, right? Uh, this, this is the kind of thing that you get hit with. Uh, these clinics are, are absolutely everywhere. This is a well-known study that came out not that long ago, written by a couple of friends of mine. They found roughly 600, I bet there are more than that, clinics in the U.S. offering unproven stem cell therapies. Now in the U.S. and in Canada, by the way, they're more about orthopedics, anti-aging, uh, pain, those kinds of things, but the, these clinics are there, and they're run, rose by MDs, <laughs> they're run by medical doctors. Uh, and, uh, and yes, they're starting to come in our own country, uh, in Canada, um, and this is a regulatory problem, but it's also a broader social problem. Now, I know this room knows this, but it's, it's important to reflect on this. There is almost, there are almost no stem cell therapies that are ready for the clinic, that have robust clinical evidence to support them. This is a nice piece by George Daly, I'm sure, I'm sure many people in the room know George, uh, that really highlights that, right? Uh, this is an incredibly exciting field, but these therapies are not ready uh, for the clinic. And there's growing recognition, growing recognition, as Rose pointed out already, that this is a real problem, right? It's a real problem. It's financial exploitation. It's hurting the legitimacy of the actual science of what's really going on. Uh, and uh, I, the other thing is underplayed, uh, I, I talked about the physical harm, but the amount of money people are spending on these therapies. In our own, our own research, we found the average about $20,000 uh, per treatment. So people are spending a lot of money on stuff that does not work. Okay, so what I want to really focus on and hammer away on, uh, hammer away at, is what is happening? You know, how did we get here? What are the social forces that allow this to happen? Well, as I've already said, science exploitation. It's been around for a long time, but I think it's worth reflecting on what's going on now and, and hype, science hype. The excitement that is around, uh, around uh, stem cells has played a big, a big role. This was a piece I wrote with some colleagues that was in science not that long ago where we were really talking about the problem of stem cell hype and how it has allowed, how it has allowed and facilitated the growth uh, of, of this industry. So what do I mean by that? I mean scientists exaggerating uh, the potential benefits or near future benefits of their work. Um, and it is, it is a problem, and we've seen it for a long time. There has been so much hype about stem cells, understandably so, but there has been a lot of hype. You get headlines like this for decades, you know, really since the late 90s, we've seen these kind of promises, right? Um, these kind of headlines, you know, stem cell therapy can repair heart damage. This was a small clinical trial that didn't go anywhere, right? Um, the miracle, uh, uh, of stem cell cures, you know, stem cells can treat diabetes. You see this kind of stuff on and on. Uh, we did a study uh, on, on what I call timeline hype, uh, myself and a colleague of mine. And so what do I mean by that? This is, this is representations in the popular press about how soon stem, a stem cell therapy is gonna be in the clinic, right? So this is 
Scientists telling the public how soon their research is going to be in the clinic. And look at the response. We found that um, approximately 70% of the scientists say that their research is going to be in the clinic five to 10 years or sooner, right? And of course, some of these claims were made like 12 years ago. Um, and all the scientists in the room know that is almost impossible, right? Am I right, Janet? I mean, it's this, this is, that is incredibly, incredibly fast, right? And of course, we suggest that the print media and other forms of media exaggerate, right, the, um, how fast the clinical translation can happen. And of course, this fosters unrealistic patient and public expectations that, that fuel that fuel that, uh, the unproven stem cell therapy industry. We also found that this industry, the, these clinics, and we've done several studies on this, these clinics uh, misrepre are misrepresented in the popular press. So this was a story uh, for all the Canadians, and I know there are a few of us here, <laughs> we'll know who G Gordie Howe is. Now, Gordie Howe is one of the most famous uh, hockey players ever. He passed away not that long ago, but he went to a clinic in Mexico for an unproven stem cell therapy. We saw this as a research opportunity, and we did an analysis of how this was treated in the popular press. And no surprise, we found that it was greatly exaggerated. It was almost all positive. It created this uncritical analysis. It, they provided this uncritical analysis of Gordie Howe's experience uh, at this clinic. Um, and, and that, for sure, fuels patient expectations. You know, they made it sound like Gordie Howe went to this clinic and he was cured or made better by an unproven stem cell therapy. Um, and we've saw, we have many studies that show this happens all the time. In fact, I would say this, this kind of media portrayal of stem cell therapies uh, is the norm, is the norm. Um, and there is you know, reports that this actual story, this story itself caused people to go to this exact same uh, this exact same clinic. You know, people said, well, I heard about Gordie Howe in, in, the, in the newspaper, so I decided to go to the exact same clinic. And one of the reasons that this is so powerful is that it's a story. It's a story about someone that we know going to, uh, on an adventure and, and, and getting better. And studies have shown that those kind of narratives, those kind of stories can have a real impact and can overwhelm the data. You know, a narrative, a good narrative, will, a good testimonial will always win. It'll always beat out the data, and that's something we need to remember. In fact, this study on, te on patient testimonials that on YouTube, we just published, this just came out on se in Cell, Stem Cell, um, uh, not uh, two days ago, <laughs> two days ago, I guess, where we, we did an analysis of these kinds of, of testimonials, and and no surprise, we found they were almost entirely positive, right? Uh, that they were improving, that the clinic I went to is fantastic. And of course, th that's going to happen because very often they are marketing tools, right? They're very powerful marketing tools. Uh, the other thing that's happening in this space is something that we call implicit hype. Uh, because stem cells have become a cultural phenomenon, because it the idea of regenerative medicine is absolutely everywhere in popular culture. It's got to the point where the press talks about it in a way uh, that the efficacy is a given, right? They do, there's absolutely no critical analysis of, of the science. So there'll be an athlete, like football players, who get injured a lot. They go to a clinic. It's reported that they're going to a clinic in order to get, uh, to get better so they can get on the field back to playing faster. There is no critical analysis, right? And we see this all the time. We did, uh, recently did a study on platelet-rich plasma, PRP, another form of regenerative medicine, uh, and we found that this uh, implicit hype was almost the norm, right? There's almost no critical analysis. One of the things that we found was really interesting is almost all the articles in the newspapers or in the popular press about PRP were sports stories, right? No, so these are stories about athletes. So you could say, well, we can't expect a sports journalist to you know, always you know, do some kind of scientific critical analysis. But if you're a reader, you see this, and it has an impact. And research tells us it has, has an impact. So most of the stories about PRP in the popular press are, uh, are sports stories. And, and look at our analysis. What we found is if it's a, if it's a sports story, and it's about PRP, it is represented as if it is already efficacious, it's routine, it's ready to go. Only 5% uh, suggest that this is an experimental treatment. Uh, there were also cosmetic stories, almost all of them represent them as if it's cutting edge, and I think that's because people want, <laughs> people want cutting edge 
cosmetic uh, treatment. And if it's portrayed, if it's a medical story, only there, only there uh, is it portrayed more accurately or somewhat more accurately where it's portrayed as an experimental treatment. And by the way, as people in this room probably know, PRP has become incredibly popular. My daughter is an athlete. She has an injury right now. Almost every doctor she has seen has recommended PRP to her. And there is no evidence to support it at all. It's experimental. Here's a study that just came out that found that PRP was no better than saline. Right? But that's become the norm, and I think implicit hype has a big, has a big, uh, part, of, is a big part of the story. Uh, and I just, Nadal just won the French Open, so I thought I'd give you this story too. Nadal, not that long ago, had a back injury. A really good example of this kind of implicit hype. Uh, it was reported that he was getting stem cell therapy on his back. Do you guys remember that? Uh, mm -hmm. And it was reported everywhere. It was all over the place, and they were almost all sports stories, and they were almost all completely uncritical and made it sound like this stuff worked, right? I could only find, at the time, I could only find one article written by a friend of mine, Paul Knopfler, uh, who is a stem cell researcher saying, no, this stuff doesn't work, don't do it. Um, that, that is what the public is seeing, right? And that is what is driving, that's what's driving this industry, you guys. Uh, the other thing that's going on uh, that is a relatively new phenomenon is crowdfunding. So people are, go are crowdfunding uh, uh, to raise millions and millions of dollars for these unproven therapies. Um, and this is a problem on multiple levels. So, th so this was a study done by, again, two friends of mine, uh, um, uh, Jer Jeremy and, and Lee, uh, and they found, what they, they did an analysis of crowdfunding specifically for stem cells, and again, found that millions of dollars were, were raised for this. Um, and it was portrayed again uncritically on the crowdfunding websites. And again, you have to think, if you are a sick person and you see a crowdfunding website, there is, there is a, again, a compelling narrative that's being presented to you. Someone who may have the same ailment you have is telling you a story about this effective stem cell treatment, and by the way, please give me money, right? Uh, so that is, that is another way that stem cell therapy is getting hyped. And what's interesting, this is a study that we just published a couple months ago, we did a, a media analysis. So how is the media representing those crowdfunding stories? Because these crowdfunding stories are very popular and they're often covered in the popular press because again, it's a personal interest story. Someone's trying to raise money for an experimental treatment. Uh, and no surprise, it's almost entirely uncritically portrayed in a positive manner. Uh, and not only that, not only that, these uh, stories often tell the reader where to send money. So think about that. So you have a newspaper reporting on an unproven therapy and helping them raise money to, to fund what is often, I'm not to be careful about my words here, but often a fraud, right? Uh, and as I said, in over 80% of the stories ask the reader and tell the reader where they can donate. Uh, very few of these stories, less than 20%, say this is ex even experimental treatment, right? Um, so the other, last thing I want to point out before I get to the what can we do part of, uh, of, my, of my talk is I do want to again highlight this idea of science exploitation, the use of sciencey language. Because I think I do a lot of work debunking unproven therapies uh, and this is becoming a very common strategy, a very common tactic. This, the use of scientific language in order to make something seem efficacious, to make something seem effective. We're seeing it all over the place, particularly with alternative uh, treatments, but, but also in this, in this space. So the use of, uh, of sciencey language, and this is one of my favorite examples of it, this is the stem cell bra. Uh, it's a bra that <laughs> somehow helps stem cells grow in that particular region of the body. Uh, and by the way, I believe it's still it's in preclinical trials. I don't know how you would do that. I, I guess there's some place in the world little mice with bras on them. But it is a really good example of science exploitation, right? Because this, they're just taking the word stem cells and sticking it next to the word bra and hoping that it sells, and I bet it did. Uh, it, this is a study that we did um, not that long ago on stem cell creams, and, and this, if you're, you know, you guys work in this space, so you know this. This is one of the areas, the anti-aging area, where this science exploitation phenomenon is happening all the time. Um, there are so many creams out there that allegedly have stem cells in them, which is, of course, scientifically ludicrous, but they say they do. And I, I actually um, went to a clinic in the, uh, for one of the, a project I was working on for a show I was doing, and they were putting apple stem cells, injecting apple stem cells into a woman's face, right? Only Hungarian stem cells, apparently, because those are the best. Um, 
But that's, that's what's going on. So we actually did a study of how this stuff is represented. And again, for sure this science exploitation phenomenon exists. I'm not going to read all of these, but I just want to highlight one. Uh, it's, it's the one in the middle there. Stemology is an all-natural, intelligently organic whenever possible. I don't know what that means. <laughs> skin care line, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of language that you see. And again, they're just trying to sell products. And here's the, a good example of the Apple one, the multi-peptide with Apple stem cells revitalizing serum, right? Um, the other thing we're seeing is alternative therapy uh, practitioners uh, adopting stem cell language and regenerative medicine language. So naturopathic community, a, a very good example of this. All, and we've, at the Institute, we've studied this community very thoroughly. Almost everything that this, this uh, community provides, has no evidence to support it. But now what they're trying to do is sell um, uh, products that are supposed to be stem cell related. Um, and sometimes they're, they're a supplement that helps stem cells, and sometimes they're giving you some kind of injection that is stem cells. They're doing all of these kind of different things. But basically, they're just exploiting the excitement around stem cells. So here's the study that we did, and you can see we call it exploiting science. And we list all of the different uh, practitioners that are doing this now. They're using the language of stem cells to, to market unproven things. Now, one of the interesting things that we found in this study that we did not anticipate is even when these were integrative health or alternative uh, uh, medicine clinics, there was almost always a medical doctor involved, which is interesting. The good news, Rose, is that there is a regulatory tool that can be pulled, right? Um, and so this is, you know, we recommend that in this piece that, that we should use that we should use that as a regulatory option, right, in order to try to stop this from happening. Why does this happen? Why are people doing this? Alas, it works. Studies have consistently shown that if you throw scientific language uh, into your marketing strategy, uh, it works. It, your, your marketing strategy becomes more persuasive. It, incre it increases the persuasiveness of, of the message. This is something that's hard to study well, but there have been a number of studies that have backed this up. Uh, this is another study that came to the same con conclusion, and, and I think this, is a, this study uh, found that, that, that it works particularly well uh, if the messaging fits with how we think um, science work, right, with our existing health knowledge. And of course now, stem cells has become part of our existing health knowledge, and that's one of the reasons that people use this. Um, tokens of legitimacy uh, is another part of this science-y strategy. Um, and, and one of the reasons why it's becoming so difficult uh, for, for everyone to tease out what's real and what's not real. What's real stem cell, uh, uh, real stem cell treatment and what's not. This was uh, the result of a workshop that I was involved in uh, with a, just a fantastic group of colleagues. Uh, and we published this piece um, where we tried to outline uh, the challenges, the challenges to, to, uh, that are created by this social phenomenon. And we, and we listed what we call the tokens of, of legitimacy. And I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want to highlight a couple. The first is this one, the use of clinical trials. What you'll see increasingly are these, these clinics say they have a clinical trial and they register the clinical trial and then they put on their website that they have a clinical trial and it's been registered. And it, they make it sound like clinicaltrials.gov is endorsing the work that they do, right? Uh, this is a real problem. Here's a piece that came out just a couple days ago highlighting how, how problematic this is. And my friend Lee Turner has done a lot of really interesting work uh, on this area. So that's a token of legitimacy. And it's one that's, that's difficult to see through unless you're willing to, to do the work. The other one, of course, is the publication problem. There are hundreds, or I'm going to say thousands, of predatory journals out there now. Journals that you can pay money. I bet you the academics in this room, I bet you you got five or six or seven emails this morning <laughs> from a predatory journal. I get you know, dozens every day, it seems like. Um, and they, you pay money and uh, you can publish. Well, these, these clinics will do that. And then they'll put their publication on their website, again, making it seem like real science when it's not. So what can we do? What's next? How can we respond to this? Uh, well, the good news is regulators are starting to respond. Um, I've been working uh, on this in this area for over a decade. I have colleagues who have been working on this for over a decade, hammering and hammering away at this problem. Um, and we're starting to see regulators around the world respond to this problem. Just last month, Health Canada put this up. 
Uh, I, it was just one of the, <laughs> a fantastic day for me because to see this kind of response because then you can start sending this out to patients and to clinics saying, let's see the data. Um, but I worried it's too late. I'm worried it's too late. Uh, here is uh, the FDA has actually been very aggressive. I won't say very aggressive. They've been, uh, uh, they've been very aggressive in the language that they've used. I'd like to see more boots on the ground. I'd like to see more action against these clinics. But it's good to see this kind of, of language flow from the FDA. Uh, and as Rose mentioned, there was recently this action uh, that was a big, it's a big success story because this is another case that makes it clear that the FDA has jurisdiction in this realm, right? It's not a medical treatment. It's not just within the, uh, the, the realm of, of, pra uh, of medical practice. Uh, this is something they have a regulatory hammer uh, over. A and I think that's good news, not just for the United States, but I think it sends a message to the world to entities in Canada. For example, Health Canada, I think it'll give them a little bit more confidence to be, uh, to be active in this realm. You're also seeing things like this. This is in, in Australia uh, just a couple of years ago where they, they ha have regulations that saying that you cannot do direct-to-consumer marketing of this stuff. I love that. I would love to see that in Canada. But we need more. We need so much more. Uh, I think we need more truth in advertising. I would like to see that, those kinds of actions uh, play out in countries all over the world. Uh, and I also think, I think one of the, the actions that we need right now, and there's no reason this isn't happening, is the colleges, the regulatory bodies for the health professions involved in these need to be more aggressive. This is a piece I wrote with, with some colleagues that came out just a few months ago where we argue that the medical colleges, the colleges of physicians and surgeons in Canada, need to stop their members from offering these treatments. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't, especially now that we have this, this uh, statement from Health Canada. Uh, we need as a community, as a scientific community, to encourage them to do that because it's not only the patients that are at risk, as Rose said, uh, it, it is also the, the science. Uh, we need to step up uh, and make sure uh, this doesn't happen. Uh, and, and we also need, all of us, everyone in this room, myself included, we need to watch how we talk about stem cell research. This was, I was very lucky to be involved in, in drafting the International Society for Stem Cell Research translation guidelines that came out just a couple years ago, I'm gonna say two and a half years ago. Uh, and in that document, we have a section on science communication, and I think that's pretty rare. I think that's pretty rare for uh, a scientific body to do that, but we devoted an entire section to science communication in part because of the problem I'm talking about today. And we really try to encourage uh, the, the stem cell research community to be careful how they talk about, about, about stem cell research and how soon it's gonna be in the clinic, but also to become part of the conversation. We need to be on social media. We need to be correcting misinformation when we see it in the, in the popular press. When your study is misrepresented, speak up. Uh, be part uh, of the answer, be part of the discussion. Uh, I think that's so important because hopefully this science is, in the future, going to uh, provide us with real therapies uh, that can really make a difference. Uh, I'm gonna end now and say thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm gonna end with my two favorite words, go science. <laughs> thank you very much, you guys. <laughs>